Welcome back, everyone, for part two of uh, the Spirit of Science National Honor Society's tutor lecturing series. Uh, this is going to be part two of biochemistry, which is chapters two and three. So the next topic we're going to touch on is water's life-supporting properties. So there are um, five main properties of water, as you can see down here. Um, and we'll go through these uh, in a little more depth in a minute. But what's really important to understand is, as I mentioned earlier, hydrogen bonds make liquid water cohesive. So there are these two terms, cohesion and adhesion, which are really important that you know the difference between them. So cohesion is the idea that water molecules stick to each other. So when you put a straw in a glass of water and you suck the water up, all those water molecules aren't coming in single uh, as single molecules, they're coming all together. And that's because water molecules can stick to each other through that hydrogen bonding as we showed earlier. And adhesion is the ability of water to, this, to stick to the sides of something. So an example, in um, plants, water can stick to the side of uh, the root to help it move up against gravity. So those are two really important um, ideas. Uh, surrounding how water is used in a biological sense. And then another idea is surface tension. And if you've ever seen um, little bugs that can walk on water, it's because of surface tension. So surface tension is basically the amount of force that the water exerts on the object sitting on top of it. So the surface tension um, that's involved when that, uh, when that bug walks on water so those insects that are usually denser than water, what they're allowed to do is work on water because the water molecules are elastic and that they can bounce off of one another and uh, they form like a fluid structure, although that's kind of cliche because water is obviously fluid. The way the molecules interact with each other allows for an equal amount of force to be exerted on both sides. Um, hydrogen bonds also moderate temperature. So thermal energy um, is energy of heat uh, uh, in a basic sense. Um, and if you ever think about boiling water, boiling water takes a long time, and a relatively long time. And that's because um, the hydrogen bonding allows water to absorb um, the, the change in temperature so that it takes a long time because of the moderation that the hydrogen bonds uh, can help uh, can help and that allows as I said before the temperature to be regulated to a point where you need to put in a lot of BTUs of heat energy for example if you're boiling water on your cooktop um, to get that water to rise to boiling point. Additionally evaporative cooling is the idea that if I put um, water on a desk and I leave it there for a few hours eventually that water is going to evaporate. Just like um, the water on a pond, for example, the top layer is going to evaporate. And when that top layer evaporates, it's because that top layer has a high amount of kinetic energy or energy of movement. And as those water molecules evaporate, the t temperature of the remaining water is lowered because everything on the surface of the water has the highest um, has the highest amount of heat or thermal energy, it doesn't really matter how you say it. All you really need to know is once that water evaporates, the body of water is cooled because the heating up of that surface water is what allows it to evaporate. Additionally, a really important topic that really allowed life to start in its earliest stages is how ice can float on top of water. So ice floats on top of water because it's less dense. So if you look at the picture, the hydrogen bonds between water molecules are fairly close. But in ice, it forms almost like a crystalline structure where there's a lot of space, and that makes it less dense. Um, and this allows the three forms of water on Earth. You have solid state, which is obviously ice, liquid state, which is obviously water, and gas, which is water vapor. They all exist in, in separate forms. Um, so if you look at ice, the hydrogen bombs for this, as I said, crystalline structure. Um, and again, that's because of the hydrogen bonds. And what, so in evolutionary history, if ice was to sink, uh, to the bottom of the ocean, for example, you would have never had those hydrothermal vents um, allow those chemosynthetic um, archae archaeobacteria uh, thrive and really start life um, 
millions and millions and billions of years ago. The next idea is that water is the solvent of life. So a solution has three different parts. You have the solvent, you have the solute, and then you have this other idea called an aqueous solution. An aqueous solution is just the idea that there's some kind of solute dissolved in water. So it can be NaCl, as you see in the picture. That's if I was to put table salt in a glass of water. That would be an aqueous solution because the solvent is water. And a solvent is whatever does the dissolving. So usually it's the um, it's it has the greater volume or the greater mass. So if I was to put a couple dashes of salt inside, the solvent would be water because it's breaking apart the NAs and the CLs. And the solute is whatever you put in to the solvent, and uh, that will be broken up. And as you guys move on to chemistry next year, you'll learn um, how these ions break up. And again, this is because of hydrogen bonding. So the uh, if you look here, the Na, so remember how the oxygen here in H2O is sigma negative, and you have the Na positive, and all these negative oxygens are going to pull the Na's away from the Cl's. And to the contrary, the Cl with the negative sign is going to want the electrons from the sigma positive, um, the sigma positive um, hydrogens in the water molecule. Um, the next idea is pH. So uh, pH is a scale that most people are familiar with, and it's on a scale from uh, 0 to 14, 14 being very basic and 0 being very acidic. And what you look at this scale here, that's the concentration of H plus ions. So H plus ions, those are hydrogen ions, and that's how we measure the pH or how acidic something is. So neutral um, has a H plus concentration of 10 to the negative 7th, and that's like basic. That's where pure water is. Um, 10 to the negative 1st is hydrochloric acid, which can be very dangerous. And 10 to the negative 13th is sodium hydroxide. And again, that can be very dangerous um, if put into the wrong hands. And then we have this next idea, which is disassociation. And this is basically the idea that water can almost lose its nucleus, um, in a sense, and allow H2O to become OH, for example. So if you look at like basic um, basic solutions, they'll have a high concentration of OH, uh, OH minus, which is hydroxide. And that's due to disassociation of water, where it can almost spontaneously um, change, its, change its morphology. Um, so the pH scale, as I said before, um, it's, it has an inverse relationship. So if you look here, the more H plus ions, the lower the pH. And the less H plus ions, the greater the pH. And this is on a logarithmic scale, which explains how uh, the exponents work. Um, but what's important, how does this, how does this translate into the, into the concepts that I'll learn later in the year? Buffers. So in our blood, our blood has a specific pH. And if it goes even 0.1 or 0.2 outside of that normal range, it can be very toxic, toxic to our bloodstream. So buffers um, are, are basically the way to ensure that um, a, a solution, and for example, let's just use our blood, doesn't become too basic or too acidic. So if there's too much H plus ions, it can absorb them or put out OH to balance it out. Or inversely, if there's too much OH, it can take up um, the OHs and balance out that pH. So then uh, kind of transferring this idea to um, an environmental science, um, rising CO2 levels um, in the oceans can actually call, cause acidification. So 25% of the, all the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean. But when rising CO2 levels occur in the ocean, um, the pH is lowered. And as I said, sometimes um, organisms aren't, very, uh, aren't adapted to these different pH conditions. Uh, for example, on land, uh, terrestrial uh, uh, plants, for example, are really uh, specific in the soil pH they need. Um, but calcification of the coral reefs occurs, um, so you'll always see those famous pictures of the bleached coral reefs, um, is what happens when H extra H plus ions, so the hydrogen ions, combine with carbonate ions to form bicarbonate. And this reduces the amount of carbonate available to build coral reefs. So you'll have microorganisms that would usually use this carbonate ion to build the coral reef structures uh, that will allow other organisms to thrive, but uh, when these carbonate ions become bicarbonate because of the extra H+, plus, um, these microorganisms can no longer do this. And this becomes a serious problem um, in terms of uh, marine biology.
Uh, the next idea, which is going to be really crucial throughout the year, arguably the most crucial, is organic compounds. So organic compounds always contain a carbon chain. So organic compounds, the difference between organic and is going to be that organic compounds always contain that carbon chain, usually with hydrogens, um, while inorganic will contain one or maybe not the other or possibly neither. So as I mentioned before, carbon has four valence electrons, and because it wants eight, it's going to be able to make four covalent bonds. And um, this makes carbon a really great molecule to be used when your body is forming compounds. Um, and as we see in this picture, carbon skeletons are the various lengths of the carbon chain. So in ethane, there's two. In propane, there's three. Uh, butene, there's four. And the reason why it's butene and not butane is because it's doubled bond between the carbons. Um, and what can happen is sometimes you can have branches that come off this carbon chain. Um, and these branches um, create uh, different um, create different abilities for these molecules to bind with one another. And as you look into later on in the year, you'll see how um, the structure of a carbon chain can really affect um, the function of a of a compound. Um, and it can be, for example, in a ring structure, in a branch structure, or uh, even in like the simplest form, ethane, in just a linear structure. Um, hydrocarbons is just a carbon bonded with a hy uh, hydrogen, and those are really common. They're everywhere here, and those are really common in our in our body. And isomers, um, so structural isomers have the same um, have the same composition chemically. So these isomers have the same chemical composition, but in a different shape. And uh, that shape, so maybe this. Uh, um, let's say this benzene, for example, if these carbons were stretched out, it'd have a different function than in this ring-like structure. 